Do you want to learn how to use Fabric CLI to automate some of your administrative tasks? Well, if you do, let me show you how. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Zane Goodman with Pragmatic Works. And in today's video, we're going to be discussing how it is that we can use Fabric CLI. That is the command line interface. We're going to be using it to perform some administrative tasks in a way that you could use to automate that process for yourself. We'll be creating workspaces and then assigning roles to those workspaces according to the users that we have in a specific group. Now, what inspired me to create this YouTube video is number one, Fabric CLI is pretty cool. It can do a lot with it. But primarily, it's because we have a Fabric boot camp. It's four days long where we can dive deep into Fabric. And in preparation for each of those boot camps for users that do not have a Fabric environment, I go and create them an account so that they can use Fabric throughout the boot camp. And normally in the past, I've gone through, created their accounts, went inside of Fabric, created their workspaces, and then assigned them to that workspace. But I realized, especially if we have a very large group for the boot camp, that there might be a way to automate that process, or at the very least, make it a bit faster. So I looked into CLI for Fabric, and I'm going to show you what I found. In the description, there is going to be a copy of this notebook that we are going to be using for this video. Feel free to follow along if you'd like. There's going to be some things you'll have to create on your own, such as users and user IDs, but you can absolutely take what we're doing here and apply it into your own environment, or at the very least, take it and learn from it and adapt it to what you need. I'll also make sure that in the description, you'll be able to see the documentation for Fabric CLI so you can perform your own research, again, to help you adapt what you learn here to your own purposes. For now. Let's dive over into Fabric and take a look at this notebook. So here I am in Fabric, I've got my notebook open. And just to give you a little bit of context here, inside of the Azure portal, you can go to a group and simply download a CSV file that's going to contain information about the users within that group. What I've done is I've simply loaded that file into my lake house. So within this notebook here, I'm just going to look at my files for a moment. And you can see I have a Fabric Bootcamp group members. It's just a normal CSV file. And we're going to look at what is inside of that file here in just a moment. My first step here is going to be within the Fabric notebook to install Microsoft Fabric CLI. Now, just a warning to you here, you can absolutely do this within PowerShell if you wanted to or in other locations as well. The main reason why I wrote all of this out within a notebook is, number one, so you can have a copy of it. And then number two, because I created some Python functions in here that are going to help to actually automate this process. So first and foremost, I'm going to hit the run button here. My session is going to get started, and I'll see you in just a second when this finishes installing. Now that that is all taken care of, let's take a look at the data. Of course, my first step is going to be to read in that file, right? So I create a data frame. It's called group into data frame. And I'm simply reading this to CSV in uh, using my dot load statement. And then I'm going to display that so that we can take a look at the data. And we'll see here in just a moment that we've got our display name, our object type, and the main items here to pay attention to is going to be display name and then also the ID. You probably will see that the ID is going to be blurred out here just for security reasons, but just know that's got a couple of numbers and letters that represent the different users that we have here. Uh, and obviously, right, we've got some silly names here. This is my account, Zane Goodman, and then I've got my not Zane account. I use this account as well as Mitchell. He has a not Mitchell account. We use this in training just as a uh, another account we can bounce off of to kind of show different features that we have available in Fabric and the other items that we train on. But again, the takeaways here is the display name as well as the ID. Now, the first thing that I want to do is I just want to display the display name as well as the ID. So I use a select statement here and I pick out the display name and ID and I use a special method called collect at the end, which is going to actually collect the individual data items from the data frame so that I can use them elsewhere. As you can see, this is going to give me this row object. I'm going to want to be able to pull this data out, which is going to be bringing us into the next step here. So in this next code cell, I use a dictionary comprehension specifically to pull out 
each username as well as that user's ID. To do that, first thing is I run the statement that we looked at just up here above, which is going to return this back to me. Then I loop through those. As you can see, I have four name and ID in this statement that returns this here. And for each of these items that I'm looping through, I'm gonna grab the name here, which is gonna represent my display name, and then the ID, which is going to represent the ID that we have here as well. What I'm doing this for, as you can see when I display this, I'm gonna have the display name for the user and then the ID. The reason this is important is because as we go throughout this process, we're gonna do two things. The first is gonna be we're going to format the name into an actual workspace name. The second is we're going to need to assign access to the workspace, and that's gonna require the Entra ID of the user. So to make sure that I'm assigning the right user to the correct workspace, I want these to be attached together. And in this case, a key value pair, which we find within a Python dictionary is going to work beautifully. So just as validation here, I'm gonna take advantage of the keys method, which will return for me the keys, which in this case, I'm expecting to be the display names. Afterwards, I'm gonna come down to the next code cell, and this is gonna be the, the first point where you are probably going to change if you were to implement this within your own organization to apply to your standards. So what I'm doing is I am formatting a workspace name First of all, I have to give the display name, and I'm gonna use that display name to create a workspace name. And the way that I'm doing that is, number one, I'm looping through with a for loop the keys from that user info dictionary. And of course, remember, the user info dictionary, the keys will be my actual display names. As I loop through each individual name, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get the first letter of the first name or the first initial. I'm gonna make sure that is lowercase. I'm gonna save that to a variable called first initial. Second step for me within this individual name we're iterating over is I am going to get the last name. But of course, I need some kind of method to ensure that I'm working with the last name here. So I use dot find to provide the index of the space within the name. And then I add one for that index. What that allows me to do is it allows me to use slicing in this case to say, hey, you know what? I want you to grab the last name for me from that display name and then finally lowercase it. Next up, I use a dictionary statement here to change the actual key of user info. Remember, that's a dictionary and the keys as of now are the display names. But I want to change that and we'll see why in a moment. I'm actually gonna change the keys in my user info dictionary from the display name to the new workspace name I am creating. Then I'm going to set the value for that key once more to the particular Entra ID that is tied to that user. This is again to ensure that by the time I get to assigning access to the workspaces that I'm assigning the right user to the correct workspace. That's gonna be very, very important for this process. I'm using a dot pop method here, and all this is doing is it's looking at user info, and it is going to allow me to pass in a key. So I pass in name, which remember, name in this iterative process is going to be one of the display names inside of that larger dictionary. So I can pass that name in, it is then going to remove the key value pair, but it's going to return the value, which is what I need in this given scenario. I need that value specifically for that key that I am now replacing within this statement here. What this is gonna give me, I'm gonna go ahead and use shift enter to run this. What we'll see here, once this is taken care of, is I'm gonna have a dictionary Looks, looking similar to what I have up here, but instead of display names, it's gonna give me my workspace names formatted as I'd like it. Again, you could change this function or create a new one if you wanted to format it in the way you'd like to have your workspace named. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this function. I'm gonna press the next run button here for this code cell, and you can see because I'm returning 
user info in its final form, that I'm gonna get the name of my workspace here. So I've prefixed the workspace name with fabric. So what we get is fabric underscore first initial last name. And then my values here are going to be the author ID for each of the users. Just for validation, let's go ahead and execute user info here just to make sure it's returning what we expect. Continuing down here, our next step is going to be to make sure that we authenticate because we are about to be doing some administrative tasks. So in this case, as I work with CLI here, and specifically within a Fabric Notebook, I am going to import OS, operating system, and create my token using Notebook Utils. I simply pass in what the token will be used for. In this case, I'm using Power BI, but this works for Fabric as well. Then I change the environment for the OS to point towards the token that I just created for my normal Fabric token and then also my One Lake token. So I point it to that new token that I've just made, and there we go. Now be aware, this is a very helpful and useful way of authenticating within a Fabric Notebook, of course, but if you are working within PowerShell, you also have other options. For example, you could just log in yourself uh, using MFA, you could also use managed identities and service principles as well if you wanted to. The point here is that we've authenticated correctly. And speaking of which, as you go through this process and as, as an administrator, you are thinking about other ways within Fabric that you would like to monitor items. Check out Manuel Quintana's recent video where he goes over workspace monitoring, which is a newer feature that was recently added and made GA within Microsoft. Fabric. So now we get to a new function, create workspaces. And this is where more of the you know, magic is going to happen. We're actually going to execute some statements here. So what I do is I create this function and it is going to accept workspace names. This is going to be a list of workspace names here in just a moment. It's going to loop through all of those names. And for each of those names, we're going to pass that name in to this command line interface statement. So we've got fab create we pass in our name and then we set the capacity name for this new workspace to PW demo trial capacity. And you could put in whatever capacity you want that workspace to use. So I'm gonna execute this function and then we get down below. Now I told you a moment ago for this function, right? It's going to be expecting a list, but we are currently working with the dictionary. The good news is, is as we've done just a moment ago, I can take a look at user info.keys and then I just pass in the list function or I wrap my user info.keys in that list function. And that's just going to ensure that we turn that into a true Python list, which is what create workspaces function is going to accept. So I continue to scroll down and I execute the function. And as you're going to see here in a moment, these workspaces are going to start being created. It says create a new workspace and this will take just a moment. So we'll see you whenever it finishes up. All right. So it finished up in about 42 seconds. Now I can navigate through the fabric UI pretty quickly, but nonetheless, that was pretty fast. Plus, if you are onboarding a handful of new users, more than three, then that is going to be another reason why this might be a great solution for you. But we're not done just yet. The workspaces are created. However, we still need to define who is going to be able to access those workspaces. So here's what we're going to do. Let's just validate and make sure that we're still working with the same data. And we are. My keys, again, are going to be the name of my workspaces. And then, of course, the values are going to be the IDs. And the reason that it is important to keep the IDs in a correct spot here is going to show itself in the following cell. So in the next function that we create, it's called assign access. It is going to take workspace info again. In this case, we are going to loop through the keys. Again, this is a similar statement that we've seen a couple of times now. We're going to loop through this list object of workspace names. And for each of those workspace names, we are going to assign access. So you might be wondering to yourself, why are we looping through the names and not the IDs if the IDs are what we want? Well, this is why they need to be tied together to ensure accuracy. Because in this CLI statement, what we do using access control here is we first have to specify what is the workspace that we are going to be assigning access to. Reason number one, 
we need the name of the workspace. And thankfully, we have it. So we pass that in here. Then afterwards, we need to apply who will be accessing this workspace. In this case, we need that Entre ID. So as we use the proper syntax for accessing values from a dictionary, we simply select the dictionary and then pass in the key which in this case will be the same workspace name. And we know that is going to return the value for that key value pair, which is going to be the ID for that user. Then we specify that they are going to be contributor. Now you can change this to member or whatever role that you would like. Now the last portion here is going to be force. Now force is definitely not recommended to use all over the place, but let me tell you why I'm using it in this case. Normally within PowerShell, certain operations such as assigning access is going to give you a prompt basically saying, are you sure? Like, are you super sure that you would like to perform this action? Well, in PowerShell, you could just type out yes and press enter and you'd be good to go. Well, when it prompts us in this environment, if we are sure, we don't really have a way to say yes. So in lieu of that, we're going to use force to basically say, yes, we're good to go. You don't need to ask me any questions. Just go ahead and assign those users to that particular workspace. So we execute this. Everything's good to go. Our assign access function is ready to rock and roll. And then finally, we simply execute the actual function itself by passing in our user info dictionary. And when I run this, this is going to start assigning access to those users. Now, as we can see, it says that not Mitchell, we were able to assign not Mitchell contributor access to his workspace and then same for not Zane. You'll see the third one gives an error here. It says the provided principal already has a role assigned in the connection. And this is just saying that, hey, Zane, which is me, that's the account that's giving the error. You are already an administrator on that workspace because I'm creating the account. It will automatically assign me to admin. But if it was a different user than uh, that was not an admin, then we would not get this particular message at the bottom. But the good news is, is we are good to go. If I refresh my page here for a moment and then take a look at workspaces, I'll be able to go look up not Mitchell and I can see that workspace was created. And then just to make sure that we are, we've got our access configured correctly. If I go to that workspace, you're going to be able to see not Mitchell has been assigned contributor. And of course, because I'm the administrator creating these workspaces, I am also set here as an administrator. Going back to the notebook though, this is a way for you to automate at least a portion of your administrative tasks within Fabric. Depending on the size of your organization, creating workspaces isn't always gonna be a super common action for you to perform, but it absolutely can be. I use this example because CLI, as you'll see in the documentation down below in the description, is very powerful for way more than what we have done here. So in the comments, I would love to know, number one, do you think you could use this within your own environment? Maybe you need to adjust a few things maybe, but still, let me know. And then number two, as you look at the documentation for CLI, what are your thoughts? As you brainstorm, how do you think you could take advantage of Fabric CLI to up your skill and automate some of your processes when you're working on Fabric. Other than that, the last thing that I wanna show you here is at the bottom, remember with CLI, you have some help within the command line or within the notebook, wherever it is that you're using this. I just wanted to point this out because whenever you are writing these statements, if you're expecting some parameter to be there that you would like to use and it's giving you some kind of error, or you just don't know what statement is next in whatever it is that you're writing, you can use help here, it's just dash dash help, and you can see what is available to you to use in your statement. Of course, I'm using help specifically within the context of ACL set, but whatever it is that you're doing within the Fabric CLI, you'd be able to use help here and it will give you some helpful information. But that is going to be a wrap on the video for today, everybody. I hope you enjoyed. I hope that you enjoy looking into Fabric CLI. And most importantly, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. See you then.